Sorry, repeat. El Salvador is going to buy an American. Have for so down, like to have for broken down white Chevy Cruze. We've got to send out there helping. Um, um, so he bought a car. It is a Chevrolet Cruze. An auto broker. And therefore, Americans could compete. Although that's not the main enterprise at all. That's basically the way we work. No, two additional cars. We have three as it is. Brings in what's called. He just bought two cars from his friend. Uh, the tariff of abominations was such a wide swing. Not only is there a division between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. What do the Federalists believe? I'll just try to save up for it. Strong federal federal government. What do the anti-federalists believe? States yeah, right. Yes, he could say okay. Not only is there a real, well, you know, an at odds and division yeah, between yeah, those people, but there is also a uh, separation of America. Okay, America is uh, naturally uh, and geographically uh, polarizing. Uh, and as we come through this period of development here, you've got three regions basically that you have to consider if you. No, really, uh, it's a strange thing. The Civil War becomes nothing more than a war of slavery. And uh, I'm not trying to make it out uh, unimportant to talk about slavery. We certainly will. But it, really, slavery. As a matter of fact, Abraham Lincoln did not free uh, or did not grant liberty to the slaves. Jesse, alcoholism the isn't horrendous. that easy. It was not a war fought over slavery. You get this idea that he declared freedom for the slaves and the South said no and the North said yes and they went to war. It wasn't at all. Uh, the North never granted freedom to the slaves till the war was almost I, over. I was at church and uh, the war was much more broad spread than that. And you'll see it if you begin to keep an eye on the difference between the Federalists and the non-Federalists or the anti-Federalists. And as you begin to see the nation polarized. Of course, the first colonies were established where? For the thing. Massachusetts, uh, Maryland, uh, Virginia, up into there, what we would call basically the north uh, uh, east part of our country, and still is to this day a separate geographical entity. Uh, we consider the northeast as a different part of our country, certainly a part of America, it's just different up there. Those people talk funny up there, you know, they say car and doer and all that kind of stuff, uh, and car doer and all that kind of thing. But, uh, <coughs> If I don't lose so my voice here, with me to church and the northern and they got saved. part of our country, northeast, is developing. I know, Jesse. You told me the story a long time ago. Years ahead but he of hates the rest Christianity of the as is. See, they had he's he's an atheist. And their cities are a hundred years older than some of these other cities. And then you've got the south, or the southern part of our country. And the southern part of our country, obviously, developing much slower than the northern part. And the climates are different. And because climates are different, they're, uh, uh, they major on different uh, uh, industries. I've been praying for ways of making a since 2013 when I was saying And they begin to polarize. Prayer in their this interests case won't work. are not the same. Understand what I'm saying? Prayers. So the southern states' interests are not the same as the northern states, and there begins to be a polarization. Not only that, it wasn't just north and south, but there was a third region of our country, and it was called the West. Everybody in America at this time is just about living, <laughs> staying alive, so how's the weather in Miami? preserving their liberty raising their families. It's but in the north and the south, incredible. there began to be two different yeah, philosophies yeah. about how to do that. The people that lived in uh, Anybody uh, New else Hampshire, here? what did they want to do? They wanted to make a living, they wanted, they wanted to raise their families, they wanted to worship the way they wanted to worship. Oh, okay. What did the people in the south want? The it same thing. Having, uh, chicken quesadillas. So while their desires were the same, what did the people in the Ohio Territory want? Well, I've never heard of that. While it's from El Salvador. The same, it's like a quesadilla in a round. To be different because you know, the of tortillas in stuff with in cheese. Country. It's so good. The North, as I said, a hundred years ahead of everybody. Oh, okay. Now that may be hard to realize, you know, uh, until you go to some They're of very eastern addicting. countries. If you ever have an opportunity to go visit or even see pictures of some of these eastern bloc countries after the Iron Curtain fell, you'll see some nations that basically have just been shut up for 70 years. So it must be 1 o'clock there, right? And in 70 years, it is amazing how far behind Can you call them, please? 
As a matter of fact, all of Europe basically is probably 20 to 25 years behind America. Everywhere I've ever been over there, uh, I mean, you kind of get the idea that you've been thrown back to the 60s. And, uh, you know, I mean, they've got nice things, but uh, uh, you stay in a you stay in a $100 a night hotel in Switzerland and you don't have a TV in your room. I mean, they got a little room downstairs with one TV up on the wall. And if you want to go down there and sit and watch TV, you can. Uh, and, you know, that's a $100 a night hotel. They're just not as developed. In Albania, the uh, children, I've got pictures of 9, 10, and 11-year-old children that were hauling gravel to repair the railroad. Okay. In 1979, yes. little kids pushing wheelbarrows to well, repair the not railroads. Not quite, quite sure. So that's a hundred years four secondary, but I mean, those people not, are it's broken and maintenance is it. And so it's hard to imagine how much development has taken place. But just think for a moment: if you took a hundred years off of today and launched yourself back to 1890, what all you're doing without? You not only will eliminate space travel, <laughs> you're back to riding on a horse. Automobiles, what, 1913, 1919, somewhere into there? I mean, Henry Ford's not around yet. You're back to riding to town on a buckboard wagon. Uh, mass production factories aren't even existent yet. Ford brought those in. You're still back to going to see the blacksmith when you needed something iron or something metal prepared or made or the silversmith. I mean, you take a hundred years away from our country and figure that at this period in time, the northern cities, the northern states are basically 50 to 100 years ahead of the south. And the south is 40, 50 years ahead of the west. And so you begin to get polarization. We'll talk about that a little more in just a minute. But you need to remember that as you watch our nation develop. Now, you know, that tend to Hold piss on people now. off. Go ahead. If Jackson got more of the vote than anybody that else in America, he's not elected. And, uh, why? Is it a call? Because your power uh, is made because of Northern Republican Congress is, and now the House of Representatives is going to decide who the president is. They've got more clout. They've got more sway. And Andrew and Jackson is an outsider. He's a southern boy. So Jackson put on the sideline. And John Quincy Adams, and again, not to say anything bad about John Quincy Adams, but uh, he was not the choice of the people. Well, at the, at the close of Adams' term, uh, uh, in rebellion for what the House of Representatives had done, and show you how this Federalist, anti-Federalist thing is still alive, as late as uh, near the end of the War of 1812, these around 1814, 1815, there was a group of states that met in what was called the Hartford Convention. And the Hartford Convention basically met and stated that they held to the state's rights to disannul any law or any treaty made by the federal government. In other words, if the federal government passed a law the states didn't write, it was their viewpoint, didn't like, it was their viewpoint, the states could say, hey, fine, we don't want it. We disagree with it. It's not the, not the law in this state. Uh, that's as late as the War of 1812, and that's the northern states now that are doing that. And the idea is the north is back. beginning to develop its own interests that are different from those of the south or those of the west, and now everybody okay. wants to protect their interests, and the best way to do that, when you have people trying to protect their interests, they always become anti-federal government. They have to. <laughs> And uh, so the North now is uh, uh, making statements. Marshall is the guy who kind of nips that in the bud by really expanding federal power, but he doesn't get rid of the sentiment. All right, in other words, he can let the wind out of the sails of the Hartford Convention by saying you can't do that, whatever law the federal government passes is federal law. But that doesn't change the sentiment in the hearts of the people. And what it does is it further isolates the people from their government. And that's what's happening in this day and time, is, is you're seeing an isolation of the government from its own people. And uh, uh, you can make all the laws you want to. Well, Jackson's idea was, uh, matter of fact, he even cited against Marshall, I believe, on one of his decisions. And uh, Marshall came back and said that law is not constitutional, therefore it's not a good law. And uh, Jackson said, let's see him try to enforce that. I mean, he just stood right up against the Supreme Court justice and said, I don't give a rip what you think. You know, you don't have any power, I've got the power, and uh, I'll enforce what I want to enforce. And you say, well, you know, that's terrible. No, it's kind of good for government. 
it's good for government to be preoccupied with itself. Uh, things like Watergate and Whitewater, all that stuff has a wonderful influence on government. The House banking scandal, that stuff is excellent because it keeps them from bothering us. Okay, it gets them preoccupied with themselves and they don't have time to sit down and figure out what else they can do to mess things up. And uh, so Jackson now is at odds with the Congress big time. He's at odds with the judiciary big time. And But the American people like him. The American people, see, they've been asserting their independence for years. The Hartford Convention and the states' rights movement, the anti-federalists, all these people have been asserting themselves, but nobody's had the guts to stand up. And Jackson now is doing it. But the sad thing about it is that, strangely enough, when people like that become... Uh, um, opposed to big government, they do more to progress the cause of big government than to bring it down. Thomas Jefferson did more to encourage big federal government in this country than probably anybody that preceded him, although he was probably the most outspoken against big government. And so, you know, the idea of history is uh, you better not trust the Republicans you just elected to get government off your back. It ain't going to happen. Matter of fact, the Republicans have always been those that have been known as anti more strong federal government than the Democrats have with both hands tied behind their back. What a thought. <laughs> now, what is it? That's just the rules of history. That's the lessons of history. And uh, what begins to take place now is that while Jackson is opposed to a large federal government, he begins to put in some of the policies that have led us to where we are today. First of all is the idea that to the victor belong the spoils. And that idea is since I have been elected now, I have, you hear the word mandate. How many times do you hear the word mandate? Right, every time somebody gets elected now, it's, it's a man. Hi, I'm Sophia you know, Lopez and, uh, from everything. Listen, if you watch California. I'm 58 years old. Just just a dirty pair of street. And from the time you watch television, write down how many times okay. you hear one phrase. And I challenge you. I want to show you how you be in program. The phrase is, change I'm, um, is good. 32, there would be 33. I'll guarantee you, you're hearing that 25 times a night, and you don't even know it. Well, to be young it's like you, I hate my age. Burger King, no spring to chicken. Taco Bell, I wish I was back in my twenties. I heard. I don't remember where it was. And I, somewhere on a news broadcast. Change is good. The gentleman is experiencing yeah, it. Yeah. Change is not always good. Or was one of do it casually. And when you hear something repeated again you, uh, and again and again, again and again, that's called propaganda. It was used in the the. Why can't we live to know how many fifty years old by the again? Change is good. You say, well, they're talking about getting change back, you know, when you give them a dollar at the drive-thru. Right. Change is good. Then why is it you hearing 15, 20, 25 times a day? Somebody's trying to convince you that whoever goes wherever and tries to change things is your best friend. And sometimes you've got all these things alone. Mm -hmm. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You got a lot of people trying to fix things that ain't broke. Under the idea that change is good. Well, Jackson begins to fix something. He says, I'm here on a mandate. The people of America have elected me and they rebelled. You tried to put me in the last time, but they've got me in here now. And so basically what I'm going to do is all you guys that work for the federal government, you're fired. I'm going to hire my own people. Do you play Ludo? And uh, he begins to fire. They dismiss I think at one time as many as one-fifth of all the people that work in the uh, I play Ludo. And starts putting his friends and people in, and, right, and uh, that's where the idea of the victory belongs to spoil has come from. That's why you have a transition when he goes to Washington every time you get a new political party elected, and all the justices are fired, or the uh, uh, attorneys are fired, and all these guys are fired. Hey, Bob, you get a new how you doing? And a new this and a new that, and uh, now you've got it on, you know, well, that's the way things are done. Why do you thank Mr. Jackson for that? Oh, I just had to deal with a couple of The guy who stood strong uh, against federal I'll government, you know what the biggest did. expenditure you have now in tax money so goes, or one of the biggest ones, they is came taking care of all and they themselves got trolled and then they got really, <laughs> they got really pissed off.
I think it was the vice president of uh, I can't remember exactly. I've been reading this week too much, That's I guess, but I'll get to there. it when we get there. But yeah, as Joe late as Roosevelt or up in through their World War One, World War Two era, there, when the vice president went to Washington, he paid to rent his own. You want to allow it? Okay. No, I'll sit. I'll troll them. And paid his own staff out this. of his salary. Troll my my brother Matthew's channel. I'll give you. I'll give it right and back. And now to you. you've got up there. You've got a vice president's wife. Is that, that in the spiritual Christians room than most in presidents Tox? had up till about 15 years ago? The vice yeah. president's wife yeah, spends several yeah. millions of dollars every year just to keep her entourage. Together. I just got pal talk like a week ago. What is and that? And finally went in there once. Going. This guy's been my next door neighbor for years, and our kids play together, and they're their friends, and you know yeah, they need a the job, and it, they to give us this job, and so there you go. To the victor belongs the spoil. Thank you, President yeah. Jackson. Did a wonderful it's not job that busy there. In there. It only like two people also, during this period of time, there, with some great states' rights, there's debate. a girl. She's no, she's, under each she was abused so somehow, some again, way, and, and she's again, lashing out. And again, she's in pain. She's lashing out. The rights, uh, of course, of the yeah, argument so under this uh, regime or this president's uh, time in office she's were called the Webster Haynes debates, a very famous debate. Uh, Haynes, of course, uh, defended you know, the, the, the fact that uh, America was states the and the, the power rested in the hands of the states. The states had the power to dissolve or whatever. And there Webster, the fellow wrote right. the encyclopedia, the dictionary that you use a lot, Webster's dictionary, uh, he was the one that maintained uh, yep, that hurt and he made a decent statement, but uh, his statement was kind of a little off the wall, at least as far as we look at it now. And the idea was uh, when he argued, he said, the power of America does not rest in the hands of the states but in the hands of the people. And the Constitution is the document of the and people. And Bob, do you know that app called and Telegram? And the Constitution establishes a federal government, therefore the federal government is the will of the people. That's, I mean, it's reasonable logic, but what happens, you know, if you get in trouble with your federal government? You don't leave a way out in that sense. But uh, the debate waxed backwards and forwards, and it got so strong at one time, Jackson becomes a very strong Federalist. And that's amazing to watch that happen. You take an anti-Federalist and put him in government and watch him turn into a Federalist. Okay? Uh, and that's what's going to happen to this bunch of freshmen congressmen who just went up there. You know, they went up there with great ideas, but the system's going to suck them up. You just watch it, you see it happen. And uh, Jackson becomes a very strong advocate of federal government. Calhoun never does. Calhoun is a states' rights man all the way. Now, remember, that's president and vice president. And it got so strong and bitter that one night at a, uh, a reception at the White House, uh, uh, the president stood up and uh, made a toast. You know, clinking the little glasses and all that kind of stuff. And he looked at his head, looked Calhoun square in the eye, and lifted his glass and toasted the, the government of the people, or the, the unity of the people, and uh, made his toast to the strength of the government. Calhoun stood right up behind him, made another toast, and he said yes, and he said the government will last as long as it remembers where its power comes from. You know, I mean, you talk about a sharp criticism. The president and the vice president going after each other in a, in a reception. So the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists are still at it. That's the point that I'm trying to make. We get this idea that, no, this is just uh, something that happened in the War of 1865, and now again it's happened in the last few years, you know, people trying to downsize government, want to take back their government. That's always, from day one, it has been the plague of this nation, is who's going to run the show. It's always a question of power and authority. I mean, it is all the way back to the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel where Lucifer said, I'll ascend the sides of the north. It's all about who runs the show. And uh, you've got people that they're not concerned about people or uh, ecology or environment. I mean, a lot of the smoke screens today are smoke screens for gaining power. People want power. And, uh, it, I mean, the roots of it are even back as far as this. During this period of time, there become, begins to be Hi, a back. division, I'm uh, even among the Republicans. Now, uh, remember, at one time it was the Federalist Party, and then the Jefferson founded the Democratic Republicans, and really the Federalist Party ceased to exist because the, the Republicans or the Democratic Republicans have so dominated politics, uh, and they basically and Bob, adapted have you heard the of Telegram? of the Federalists anyway. And uh, when Jackson gets in power, though, there begins to be a little division. Uh, matter of uh, fact, he was referred have... to as King Andrew for a while.
because he really didn't care what anybody said. If he felt like it was good for the country, uh, I have that too, and I had a heated discussion with somebody care of it. this morning. He vetoed more legislation than all the other presidents before him. Uh, before him, the legislation that came to the president would oh, be vetoed okay. if, uh, uh, number one, they felt it was unconstitutional or uh, this something along that line. Jackson put just vetoed if he didn't think Prince Philip on a pedestal, thinking he's something perfect in every like, really way. Didn't even think about it. And I told uh, him, so I said, Jackson was a patriot. Well, he's just and he as was much sinner as I do. If he doesn't accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and you know he's not a Christian, he's going to hell. Government, I don't. And this think person got really upset at union together. It's the same thing, Lincoln. I think Lincoln becomes uh, uh, basically a pawn in a game, yeah, and uh, he's trying to hold that. a nation together. Sometimes we make Lincoln out to be a little more ugly than he is. Sometimes we make him too great. Uh, uh, I think basically he and Jackson alike were just common men trying to do the best they could well, it's under the truth. some real extreme adverse I mean, all conditions. his riches, his fame, Jackson's his fortune, to together. his prosperity, and, uh, that's not going to get him into uh, heaven. basically leads or encourages a split that occurs in the political parties. And uh, the Republicans divide, and then all once you've got a group of them calling themselves Share national them. Republicans. Gospel. Share with them. And uh, rather than Democratic Republicans. But, uh, and along about 1830, the Democratic yeah, Republicans drop the last part of their name do and become known as just Democrats. And that basically the, is the Democratic Party that you, you have know, today. It was formed about I'm worthy of hell just as the next person. And, uh, so of course, the I can't be telling GOP somebody else that you're going to go to the place that I'm worthy they of. Go back supposedly a little just bit further. the same. But the Democrats uh, basically come into are, existence uh, around 1830. Even though I'm worthy the opposition yeah, the again same. to you Jackson I mean? grows to such an extent like, that the uh, the parties divide again, and you have a group known as the Whigs. I mean, have you ever heard of the Whig Party? Right uh, the Whigs coming into existence, the WHIG, in and, yeah. and the term is a British term. You know. We because the British the uh, individuals in Parliament, you know, the little wings and all that kind of stuff while they're in there look kind of so stupid. And know. Uh, they still do all that. But, right, but the Whigs still, uh, in England had been formed in opposition to a tyrannical king. To us, right? To give you an idea, you know, we're dealing yeah, here with a president Prince who Philip thinks he's a king, or at least in their eyes, above he us. He's just so the same as us. He has Whig no party in opposition to King Jackson over here. Rank more and, than uh, the what Whig we party do. comes into existence. Now, very quickly, let me skip ahead. You've kind of got the, the proceedings. Um, following on the heels of uh, Jackson comes Van Buren, Martin Van Buren. And uh, basically, that's enough said about his presidency. And he's kind of like one of them Gerald Ford characters that, you know, you say, was he president? Uh, uh, Van Buren was the president. Doesn't do a whole lot. Uh, following Van Buren, another war hero is elected. And his name is? Harrison. All right. You had the right answer a while ago, just the wrong time. Harrison is elected. William Henry Harrison, who had been the great uh, fighter in the War of 1812, had led the army uh, for the American but cause the and had uh, won some great victories up in the Canadian area. Uh, uh, he runs on the ticket uh, with a man by the name of Tyler, yes. Harrison and Tyler. We don't and uh, that's where the uh, uh, running phrase, you know, typically new and Tyler too. I guess it was the first country, the first political life. slogan probably ever developed. Uh, a lot of rhetoric didn't say much. Tippecanoe had been the battle yeah, of Harrison Yeah, but that's sugarcoating it. Over in you know, the Illinois have, uh, area. With, and he'd become known as Tippecanoe because Christians of his great victory they there. Sure and, uh, they don't and want so to tell the, the evil side of presidential of campaign was either you've got to heaven or you've got to hell. Uh, he's elected. And America again, you know, uh, America always historically feels anything. more patriotic and feels stronger we have when it has a military life. hero as president. It's obvious. Uh, go all the way around if you want to, but if you look at history, it's uh, that's the way uh, war Death heroes exists. always have a better time, better chance of getting elected. We all the know thing that. In, in the 60s when You're John Kennedy ran for president of the United anything. States. It is what it John is. John Kennedy proposed a real threat so to the, the American way of life in that he was the first Roman Catholic and the president. The way around that or at least to have a serious and contention the opposite for of death. And uh, the press made a lot out of it. Thing. I mean, they life. used that against him to have and it he counterattacked it with the fact that he was a great war That's hero, you know, PT-109 and all that. That's not which sure really, to be honest with you, he wasn't that 
That's great something people want. Want. Kennedy was not nearly you as great a hero as they made him want to be. Want to not to but go to hell, they, uh, that's not a good uh, want. You know, they used that counterattack on him knowing full well that America respects a military man. That one of them just sounded like something. And uh, it's an interesting thought. But Harrison something gets elected, America breathes a sigh of relief, and 30 days later. Yes, exactly. But there's a dark side to it, too. You can't ignore it. And in order to a male that's You either choose, go to heaven or go to hell. There's no purgatory. Harrison is gone and Tyler is in power. I'm going to leave off there this morning, but for <laughs> good, good morning. morning. Look at these uh, different countries or different ideas that are developing in our country. Um, basically, you've got three countries. You want to remember that as we go. Two points you need to remember. I know I keep hammering them. But if you're going to understand history, you have to understand the difference up, between federal government and state rights, morning, and you have to understand the different regions of America and the way they think. Uh, we talk about this being a great melting pot, you know, and, uh, where, you know, everybody's together, and boys, it's an integrated society. Not on your wake up wild, early, get man. Shop early. Yeah, one twenty nine your wild boss, and dreams. Anybody and hopefully I'll be uh, home, it'll be late. The boy, government has basically used that to their advantage. The government has been the great grandmother. Good morning there, son. And she's doing it in some real extreme ways. Okay. Uh, I'll give you the difference yeah, in ideal no, man, I America. had America. Of course, I had a wake Several to months ago out in California, uh, the fellow grabbed a can of spray no, paint and was painting graffiti uh, all That's over the walls. The they got uh, me unloaded at Walmart. They're in California, I, and a guy uh, drove his car, down car down here shot to the dead. Road Ranger. Shot him right in the back. Stephen, he does have an in-house well, 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 coming back well, negative, well, revoked well, HO. He does have just quite a few sons of mail. That made it by the airport, by fresh spray inside the city of Chicago. A fresh, fresh, you say, what is whatever that? the hell That's it is. two different ideals. Fresh Express. <laughs> Two different ideals. Uh, uh, produce to say that America taking it is over a fully to integrated society. And you're nuts. That don't pick up until. I'll tell you something else. Toledo is not even a fully integrated society. Uh -huh. Well, You've got different down, viewpoints easy. everywhere you go, and uh, the idea of the federal take that over by my house. I gotta go to Giant Eagle thing, and deliver so that tomorrow morning. Care care that's not true. Uh, you don't have a clue what people I want. Stop by the house. I don't have a clue what people want. I know what I want, but what I want may not be. Hey, what's up, everybody? And the idea that somebody's going to represent us both when they don't even know we don't even know what we want all the time. How you doing, this lady? You get this polarization. Good morning, Let me Chris. Give you some ideas. It's 1032 here. You guys are in, in the, the north. future, and I'm in the uh, past. The north doesn't have any farms. Very small, you poor farms radio. when you find them. Not uh, not large, uh, That's where the future uh, agrarian is society. A lot of small farms, you know, five or ten acres. Uh, kind of like we'd see today. Uh, by five or ten yeah, acres. Yeah, one twenty-nine. He's right up on the hill. And, and uh, uh, you know, know, basically doesn't have anything. Yeah, Very uh, good uh, harbors in the north. We already know a lot of good harbors. A lot of good docks. Anybody know? You find an abundance of the morning when you're ready to go home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is a cooler climate. Yeah, this is more uh, I don't know. Strong uh, industry. Maybe yeah, you're about to go out and like to go up there. Yeah, but that's where the industry is. They may not. Say what you want to, you know, everything's you know, moving south. Is, uh, you look where the industry's at right now. Yeah, and just the industry is where there's a cool climate. They might. Just to reset my arm. Stay south. Okay. I've lived in the South. I got to pick up some South. Spirit. I blow You're going to lose your duck in big time when you get. You say, why? It's just the difference in climate of producer. So I can actually. Uh, you get down in Mexico like and it's, you know, manana. Thank you, sir. Yeah. 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 Those people are lazy. Yeah. People. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what, I've never seen as hard working people in my life as Mexicans. I say that to their credit. They'll outwork you and I any day of the week. I didn't like it. It's really comfortable. I don't understand how she didn't like it, but. It is hot. Sunny do use it. Instead. And uh, the further south you go, the warmer yeah, the I climate gets, two of, the less uh, conducive it is to do uh, work. I was like, and oh, no, the north I got to get my bamboo. Y'all don't climate. take my bamboo pillows. The north had a lot of water power. Because usually there's a lot of pillows. forceful rivers don't up here. You look at Niagara pillows, Falls man, and some of those areas. And uh, that power, that water can be harnessed to produce power. So the north physically has got some real oh, strong yeah. advantages. You take the south, for instance. The south, we got what we call I come back the song home. up the lazy river. I've got some flat. Most southern rivers, you know, it's kind of. You know, they're not going anywhere. The they're not in a hurry. 
uh, not a lot of strong you know, it's all like a lot of large you know, folding over. It's like, what the heck? Is not Where's my pillow? Four and Where is my pillow? Can you imagine? Uh, four and five hundred kids took it. I go in there. And one well, family like, was Are you stealing my climate? pillow? Very few harbors. <laughs> I have to get that harsh. Think about like, the number of harbors in the northeast as opposed that are not to the yours. southeast. This is my pillow. Not a lot of good harbors on my and side of the bed. Lot of sand it is not your pillow. Down on the southeast like coast. A, this is how. So not a lot of good harbors I mean, to ship your goods out of. How much is this? How use it? Cotton and tobacco, basically. Uh, they but, export but Bob, a it's, time. It, they, uh, very few it, roads it, in the it, south. It's daddy smell. North. It's like not many oh, roads this is at my all. dad right here. And then they to the west, out in the west, is. you've got it's even larger farms. Girls that do it. What unusual to have two or three thousand acre farms in the Midwest. Uh, Simon Kenton, when he came into this country, basically at one yeah, time laid claim from all of the land from Springfield, Ohio, with, oh, well, down they had almost to the over in the living room and they needed a pillow. That was that his doesn't claim. make any sense. And they uh, have their basically, own pillows. they restricted him later on until he owned one county in Kentucky, Kenton County, right if you cross the river there. Was Simon come Kenton's on, claim. man. Uh, you know, they took some of his land away from him. Daniel Boone laid claim on I don't know how many thousands of acres of land. Uh, huge, oh huge farms. Uh, not a I lot of great on. crop growing out here, I though, at first. They grew now. some corn, they grew some wheat. There's a moderate it. climate here, I absolutely so no harvest. And no roads. I'll use it and come back take they a shower a at night cattle, or something. A lot of pork and a lot My of towels on the floor. But you see how the differences are beginning to this? develop. We'll talk about Who it more did this? Week, cause oh, that you didn't even get this out of the life. towel closet. We are trying are to make some progress it? here you know, through darn, the what? history of uh, the United States, yeah, and uh, we're trying to skim uh, a little bit uh, oh, more man. than they we were, rather than going your, into your great detail. Or... And uh, Get out I of the taught shower. Use it for the... American history last Sunday in Lexington, no, Kentucky man. for Brother Kaufman again. Yeah, I take a year ago I was right there, home and they, uh, I, I take uh, uh, said, boy, are you still doing that? And I, so I ashamedly said, teaching. yeah, we're still teaching like, American yeah. history. <clears throat> and they said, well, last time you were here a year ago, you were teaching on the... Revolutionary War. Where are Damn you now? Great. I said, well, we just uh -uh. finished the war. I ain't leaving in here. So we're making rapid progress here through uh, the history. We actually are covering it at about the same speed that it occurred. You gotta hide it. And uh, oh, dude. Uh, we're, yeah, we're no, trying now to pick up the pace like a little bit. We brought you up. really up to about so 18, 30, 18, 40, somewhere like, in that avenue it, there. And uh, we've really looked at the work. presidency of Andrew yeah, Jackson and is. kind of uh, backed away from there. And this morning what I'd like to do is uh, not digress. Oh, my God, go you said the dog. Your aspect. dog does and that. Of course, that's the Zero. important the aspect, aspect as well as bringing in some other he's ideas. He's got to have your towel. Uh, and that is uh, he's waiting about 1790, late 1790, maybe upwards of 1800. There was an event that occurred in our nation that uh, is not recorded much in oh, secular about history, your dog. although it is a great part of secular history, and it is touched on in most hilarious. all secular <laughs> history. It was called the Second Great Awakening. <laughs> we talked about case. the Great Awakening <laughs> that occurred He's in the early have days of our He'll country before your really your our center. country was a right country. Out. Uh, like there that, was uh, the event known uh, as the no, Great Awakening. You have it wrapped around you. Days, you'll try to pull it uh, off. Yes. The uh, pilgrims Zero and the Puritans no. and the colonies that had been established began to uh, find themselves affluent. Affluent in the sense that they were no you longer get it afterwards, dude. Death, and the medical problems you know, I can't uh, use it after uh, by and large had buddy. been uh, oh, uh, taken care of. People still died, but not to the extent that they did, uh, for instance, at Jamestown, where the death uh, rate was 90%. At uh, one time in the founding of that colony, and uh, oh. Americans uh, began to become affluent well, you know, the colonists, and as they did, affluence is always a temptation to withdraw from no kids, and it's always been that way. So, uh, I found a note in my Bible this week that uh, was written you know, in Genesis that the quickest road to Sodom and Gomorrah is the road of affluence. And uh, that's yeah, what the food aggression and he ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah. He like saw the well watered plains of Jordan. He desired a good life. Uh, there's nothing wrong that was his own problem. He's desiring a good life. I think probably all of us are as good and as easy as we can get it. But anyways, but we the ended up in the rest of going here. We began to gain those things. We should get God. Uh, it's an amazing uh, thing that we the sinfulness uh, of our own heart it. and that we really well, don't want God good. if we don't need God. But anyways. Uh, it's, uh, you know, somebody sweet. goes to the hospital. She's and really, really sweet. Like I could tell by her eyes. I call the preacher. 
Uh, they may never. I talked to some people this week and um, said, well, uh, we I'm need somebody drive. to pay our bills. Uh, uh, and, and I said, well, I'll sure uh, take that own. under consideration <laughs> and, and we'll take a look at that. And I said, oh, well, you well, had to get rid of the dog you were training up. When you well, you know, we really don't, you. Uh, oh, don't go to up. church anywhere. And uh, we just, uh, you know, we, we try to go when we really need to go. That was the statement. And uh, I said, well, you know, it seems to me like you're in such financial difficulties, you probably need to go where morning you thought you did. And uh, that's the way out. that people run to God you know, when they need God, when they don't need God, they back the away from Him. And the college being no being different than you and I. As they oh, began man, to this conquer is the spot some of these things that have been devastating food. to these early oh, settlers, we'd always stop right uh, they here and play. began to yeah. back away from the Lord, began to back away yeah, from God. Sucks. And uh, as that happened, um, I haven't taken tragedies began to fall apart. I haven't much taken so her out yet. The son of William Bradford was right in his own skittish, chronicles so that uh, uh, the most wicked the family, uh, group of people that he'd ever been around. That's an amazing thought, considering where you and I live today. But somewhere in the confines of all of that backslidden condition, God... God began to move in the hearts of his people, and a great revival broke out in this country, and uh, was called the Great Awakening. That uh, brought about the conversion of literally thousands of people, Maybe a Jack Russell, and uh, for a time turned America back to God. For a time brought America back to a stable uh, existence. People uh, uh, loved the Lord. There was a, a, a basis of morality that was established in the country, and uh, America enjoyed again prosperity again. Um, you watch the growth and prosperity of America, and what's amazing and is you're going to find that the growth and prosperity of America parallels the revivals in this country. You're never going to hear that from Washington, D.C. You're going to hear economists get up and say, well, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to inflate this and deflate that. Uh, but if you yeah, go back and look I'm at like, the times of revivals in how this much, country, how much you find that they parallel running around and exercise uh, the growth do they and need? the prosperity nah, of this country. Nah, For instance, the last great revival that America really saw <laughs> yeah. was in the late 1940s. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> Uh, you go from the 1940s and the decade beyond that into the 50s, and uh, what has happened beginning in the 60s? You begin to see the decline of America. There has not been a revival in America since 1940. And uh, today, we talked about since 1963, the crime rates increased 700 percent since 1963. Uh, you can go through all of those statistics, and uh, you'll see the decline of America. So I believe we have been wrong. We have not been wrong. Both should be on the ground at this time. There's a lot of confusion going on right now, so I'm trying to get more information. Parallel, uh, righteousness. Righteousness exalted a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And uh, America now Lord begins to reap you. its own reproach, and uh, we're going to see that. But uh, along about 1790, what we know as the Second Great uh, Awakening began to take place. Let me give you some ideas along this line, and uh, uh, some great preachers. We talk about uh, our heritage, and you always hear preachers that drop the names of other preachers, and uh, these preachers began to be established in the Second Great Awakening. Now, the interesting thing is we're well, up here in 1990. Five. But uh, as Saint you begin Bernard, to study American history, you're going to realize we're not like, so far removed uh, you know, from these people vehicles, as we might tend you know, to think. To leave. Uh, we tend to look at you know, a decade as, as an eternity, and, out to, and it's one of the disadvantages to, to being you're American. Not doing your job. Uh, our history is so short that and because it's only this big, we tend to look at this much of it as though it was you know, a long period of time. Uh, con contrasting that, the Europeans, you know, they've got a, a history of thousands and thousands and thousands of years. That's funny. And uh, because of that, they don't look at 100 years as anything. She's right, she's right. Matter of fact, they still live yeah, in dude. houses that are 100 Saint years old. Bernard's, I love them. Uh, I think uh, we mentioned I, I Dean and Melanie Manciferi in Italy when we stayed with them. Their apartment building was 600 years old. <laughs> How'd you like to go to sleep at night in a room with dogs that it was built 600 Lord. years ago? And uh, it's an unusual thought, but we were in churches. We were in some churches over there that were a thousand years old. I mean, the building was built a thousand years ago. And the Europeans always look at Americans kind of down their nose. And it's not. 
think they're better than you are. They just think you're yeah, uh, summer or Christian. And uh, yeah, I think I mean, it was you summer. Know, you and I, we, this was we long talked long about our great car history and great so careers that we had. Look how efficient it is here. These people are talking thousands of years. And then this dog and uh, their attitude is kind of like you grow up somewhere. But that's kind of the way they look at you. But it's true. Look at our look at when you go back to 1800. And that's forever. That's a long time ago. But really, I can't. It's only a couple hundred years. It's and, too uh, big. Uh, things, uh, things. Uh, happened that's, 200 that's years ago. Hair. And out of Joe. years ago in this nation still today affect your life. And yeah, uh, this Haley has a lot we of Some of these names, uh, uh, you'll begin to see, I believe, what took place. A lot of Let shit going on with that. Let me just here. I'll do this first, and instead of waiting and doing it last. Uh, a list of things that took place between the end of 1812. The general method of teaching is that the southerners were the haters of blacks and the northerners were the rescuers and the whole civil war revolved around the issue of slavery and that just is absolutely as unfounded as any historical can to, be. You know, uh, the slaves were not even free to the end of the Civil War. If slavery was the issue of the Civil War, why weren't they freed before that? Abraham Lincoln never declared the slaves free um, until the uh, end um, of the Civil War. And uh, so if that's geez. true, if the Southerners were the haters, geez. Andrew Jackson had no, the largest no, 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 uh, black no, no, Sunday school class no, no, no. in all of uh, the South. He had about 200 yes. black uh, boys and girls in a Sunday school class. Oh, he talked to you. Uh, you had, uh, uh, you probably had some uh, problems in the South, but I'm going to tell you what, we'll show you had some problems in the North, too. The idea of the Civil War, the main issue of the Civil War, is the issue that began all the way back in 1776, and it was the issue of states rights. It was the issue that almost defeated the United States Constitution when it was first formulated. And uh, uh, that issue that called in everybody passed in New York and Germany as well because it did not include the rights of the states and the individuals. Uh, and that uh, thing grew back and forth. And we get to Andrew Jackson. Remember, Jackson takes the office of president every day during lunch break or something. He turns on his predecessors and he says, "I am not here to represent the America. I'm here to represent the people." And uh, he became a, a national hero because of that attitude. He said, "It's time for government to be downplayed." Sounds like a you know 1993 Newt Gingrich or something in some respect. Not in many, but in some. And uh, he said. It's time to, to decrease the size shedding. of the government. Government's becoming it, a leech on the down, backs of people. The feeding, and uh, Jackson was acclaimed as a hero because uh, of that. You know, uh, and that's what the people were looking bones. for. But uh, the War of 1812 ends. In 1815, I mentioned you know, to you the fact like that right that. Uh, at the closing days like of the war, it, just, uh, Napoleon began shed. to... Uh, lose his prominence shed. in Europe, he began and to lose his power, and he began to wane, and the English the were able to put more resources into the you know, uh, war with America. She's so like that. Uh, like America got into some trouble when they got involved in the War of 1812. But as far as her shedding, it's, it's there. It ain't really that bad. They have the Duke of Wellington, and that brings to end really probably one of the last great types of the Antichrist. Actually, if you look through the Bible, you find uh, a lot of men in the Bible. Like, 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 uh, if you study history, there are some men that are tied to the Antichrist in American Rush history, Rush not American history, of it. in that sense. Just but uh, one of the Huskies and Napoleon saw a world conquest. In other like like words, they saw a world conquest. And of course, it was pretty cool. New Testament days, Daniel the Great, the time for the Antichrist. He's mentioned in the book of Daniel, not by name but certainly by his position. So there are uh, individuals throughout uh, the history of the world that have been types of the Antichrist and what he's going to establish. But Napoleon's defeated in 1815. Uh, in 1816, the American Bible Society is introduced. Now again, this is at the tail end of, uh, or at least midstream, of what we call the Second Great Awakening. There is a revival taking place in America, and we'll talk a little more about that. In 1824, just some of these things for your information. I just noted down some things I thought were uh, uh, worth remembering. 1824, a fellow by the name of R Louis Braille from France uh, invented something that you probably ought to know just from the title of his name. He invented uh, a system of reading for the blind. 
and um, the, the system of Braille was introduced. In 1828, Noah Webster uh, published the first ever dictionary that was ever published, uh, the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary. Some of you fellows have it. And uh, Webster's purpose in uh, writing his dictionary was so that people could more fully understand the meaning of the words of the Bible that they read. Uh, a lot of great noble ideas made about education in this day and time, but when uh, people sought to educate people in uh, those days, uh, it was uh, a desire to educate people to the truths of the Word of God. And education without godliness is rich, uh, uh, now it's the rich game. paganism is about all it is. The way game. And uh, Webster publishes a uh, dictionary. If you look at that dictionary, away. I have a copy in my office. Uh, in many, many of the definitions of words, he quotes that the verse of scripture where that word occurs. Uh, he, you know, he give you a definition of what the word means and tell you what it was, whether it was Latin or whatever, you know. And then he'll give you a sentence with that. Uh, uh, word used, and, hour and, and probably minutes. I would say 90 no, to 95 percent of the time, no, you have a verse of scripture quoted yeah, maybe, maybe. with that maybe. word in it. And word. so, you know, people say, well, uh, the religionists yeah. and the religious right yeah. trying to Chicago push themselves is. into American history, and that's simply not true. We're just seeking to maintain Friday. the position we've had all the way through. Uh, Webster's Dictionary is published in 1833. Um, it's uh, cool because I'm already on me what happened in 1833. Nope. Yeah. So I don't have to deal with all that nonsense. The guy's name was oh, John. John. It really is a Chicago player. Okay. That seems where all the Nothing runs like a deer. There. John Deere in 1833 invented the first steel plow. Now think about it for a moment. That's less than 150 years ago. Less than 150 years ago, the first steel plow was introduced to agriculture. And you think about before that time, how many of you have ever seen an old-fashioned means of plowing? They used to take wooden spikes and drive them down through timbers, and they'd drag those behind horses, or they'd have a long wooden spike, they'd drag one plow, and they'd use wood and, and uh, sometimes stone implements. Uh, and 150 years ago, which is not a long time, the first steel plow was introduced, and you look at what God's done with America in 150 years. Yeah, uh, it's remarkable to see that much taken Even if I got go in that the, short of span Chicago, of time. I that's not a very long time. 1834, uh, Cyrus yeah. McCormick invented the reaper. Damned if I'm going uh, You know, the ability to go out there. Now you've got a I used to go up to there and to go up. What is that, Now you've got a reaper that can bring the stuff in. 1835, Morris the invented the telegraph and uh, instantly uh, brought got America into a new era, the era of communication. And um, it made America about a third of the size that it had been at the time. Because you could now communicate with the frontier in just a matter of minutes. Uh, Whereas before it was days and days and days uh, to get a message from point A to point B. In 1835, uh, John Marshall was uh, one of them oasis the died. They had uh, it was probably an Euros, or something. They had uh, when they uh, were having Euro, his funeral service, and Marshall was one of the fellows spots. that you remember uh, established what we and, call uh, federal tendencies okay. in our government. And uh, much to the disdain even like, hey, of the man, people good? and How's the president, the Martha good. was a Where good man. Where are you man. from? <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to give you the impression he was <laughs> not. And uh, uh, Adams was a good man, and Washington was a good <laughs> man. Those <laughs> right. men were what we call federalists, and the federalists desired a man, I, dude, I remember, system of federal I government that, that controlled the states was, and the people. And uh, many of the decisions of Chief Justice no Marshall established in this nation a strong federal system. Really, to be honest with you. Marshall was one of the key players <laughs> in the war between the states. 294 used to be just as because jacked he had up so backed the states into a corner by uh, his interpretation matter. of constitutional law now, that they literally had no more opportunity other than to revolt. To uh, they and didn't now, have a means of solving problems. Now they even have problems. 355. And which uh, is when even Marshall dies uh, at his funeral, they. Peeling out the bell pole, you know, for his funeral, and they were shouting the Liberty up. Bell, and that's when it cracked. Uh, you know, that'll, that'll give you a thought there. I think it's rather an ominous thought. Uh, the Liberty Bell says, proclaim liberty throughout the land, and when Chief Justice Marshall dies, uh, liberty's cracked. And uh, I think that probably says more than people might uh, believe or understand. In 1836, Sam Houston becomes the president. Zoom on by of the Texas Territory. Texas is yes, an unusual sir. place. How many of you ever met any Texans? We have some folks awesome. this morning. It used to be in uh, Austin. Can't do Texas that. Texas is an unusual on, uh, place. 
and uh, they are really what we call an independent sort of people. Uh, and uh, that uh, individual states which is funny because is going to be the issue of our day. I think during uh, the day it's week, the state of Georgia price, just passed a law that said the Brady price, Bill will not be respected in the state of Georgia. Yeah, I think it still works. They don't give a flip what the but I always take that so, instead of going straight uh, down. You know that we we I'll like take that because that's so the individuals and all of us. But I'm gonna tell you what that attitude and sentiment is what started the Civil War. Indiana. And it's kind of interesting that Georgia would do it. That's where, you know, the Civil War started. And uh, so here we go again, maybe. But uh, Texas, in a, uh, in a different idea from uh, the rest of down America, Texas was literally another country. Which is weird over there. <laughs> Texas was its own independent country. It's supposed to be east Texas and west, 90, president. but no, it's going north and uh, south. And because of that, they still have good a ways. real independent spirit about them. There are things in Texas, uh, several years ago, I preached under for Brother Wood every year in Houston, and uh, several years ago while I was down there, a fella went to... Uh, uh, Pick up another man's car. He was repossessing I mean, it. He had to pay his payments. And uh, one morning he backed his tow truck up onto the driveway and Especially put the chains around the thing and jacked it up. And while he was doing that, the man came out of his house uh, and shot him to death in the driveway. And, uh, you know, somebody said, well, what'd they do to the guy? They didn't even arrest him. Because there's a law in Texas that says you can use any measure you feel is necessary to protect your property. Gonna take that and uh, that car was his property in his name. So uh, you say, well, that's an unusual group down there in Texas. Strange. That uh, several years oh, ago. Oh, you're, you're talking about I believe down they're from Michael. Ireland. I was down there when that happened too. They climbed over the fence into a guy's backyard and they were playing a prank. They'd knock yeah, on the door and run and hide. And while they were doing that, this guy came around the other side of the house and shot one of them in jail. And there's a big deal, you know, by the gun rights, ban the guns, that type of deal that said we need to do something. Yes, that's sir. a law in Texas. They don't even arrest those people. Yeah. Uh, if somebody breaks into your home in Texas, you shoot the kill. No one ever get off one of those. And things. you say, well, boy, that's a terrible place you to live. Got a flat well, top. Those crime rates. Other than if you take Houston out of Texas. Uh, you probably got the Some of those bridges are still states. lower than 13.6. And uh, it's Whatever a you see, I always see it. Never there, see a lot any of that independent well, that spirit. Sure. Sam Houston becomes the president of Texas, and uh, uh, of course he governs that state. In 1836, McGuffey. This is Shinu, I'll be able to tell hey, what's what going on this one. Uh, McGuffey publishes his first it's set of readers, Jim. and the McGuffey there. reader is used in oh, uh, American had education news, for uh, literally, uh, I think a little better than a hundred years. Uh, the McGuffey reader is used to teach boys and girls how to read. And uh, yeah, Max, now, really. Uh, as Sam Houston became oh, president of the Republic of Texas, let me continue the story a little bit here. The Mexicans yes, Friday, saw last Friday, uh, uh, the Texans the as their worst enemy, and, then, and so uh, the Mexicans set their sight on life taking support, Texas and no as function, part of really Mexico. No function going on, and uh, we won't go into all the details about the Alamo morning, and all that kind of stuff. Like, but hey, the Mexicans come after uh, the Texans. And uh, when it becomes yeah, obvious that Texas cannot withstand the attack of the entire Mexican country or the Mexican army, uh, they allow themselves to be annexed by the United States of America in 1845. In 1846, the United States declares war on Mexico and proceeds to whip them. And uh, end of story, Texas becomes part of the United States of America. Now, that brings you up to 1846. Just real hit and miss. I said we were going to skim, and there we are. Let me take you into a different category, and that is the category of pre-Civil War sentiment. And uh, we talked about uh, even as early as Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson despised the Federalist idea. Jefferson believed that states should have the right to govern their own affairs. Jefferson believed that the people, not the Supreme Court, had a right to interpret the law for themselves. I read some of those quotes to you. Jefferson despised the Supreme Court of the United States. He said it would be the undoing of American freedom. It's amazing. Some of these men become prophetic in their teachings. And uh, Jefferson said, if you want to know what the Constitution says, ask the American people. They can tell you what it says. And uh, 1330 Congress of course, Street that's for not the way that it works. Uh, but that idea of who runs the show has been bounced back and forth from the states to the federal government from the very inception of this country. 
and um, it continued to be bantered about through the wars of 1812. We talked about Jackson and his influence. Jackson, a very strong anti-federalist. The sad part is the individuals that seemingly profess to believe that big government was a threat yeah. to the people were the ones that have been most guilty for implementing big government. That's an unusual thought, but Jackson did more to increase the size of the federal government than anybody that succeeded him while he professed to be on the side of the people. And uh, I guess it's just a strange thing. I can't understand it, can't figure it out, but it just seems to be that way. But along about 1830, uh, and this is still 35, 40 years before, at least 30 years before the uh, uh, Civil War was to begin. And uh, W.L. Garrison began to publish the first of its kind in America, a newspaper called The Liberator. And uh, The Liberator was an abolitionist newspaper. It began to deal with the uh, ideals of abolishing slavery. Now, the majority of people in America were for the removal of slavery, even in the South. And the problem was, who controls how it's done? Okay. Uh, who controls the method of how it is accomplished? How will we get rid of slavery? You've got that same problem right now with all this federal mandates. I mean, you've been listening to the federal mandates and the states say, we don't want any more mandates. You want to send us money? Send us money. But don't tell us how to spend it, right? That's the issue of the day. That's the issue of the Civil War. You want to get rid of slavery? Fine. Just don't tell us how to do it. I didn't copy that. And that was the issue of the day. Uh, and the uh, abolitionist was a good newspaper. I mean, it exposed or expressed an opposing viewpoint to the uh, folks that were pro-slavery. And uh, the idea of America has become, if a fellow had slaves, he was, was pro-slavery. And that's not true. George Washington had slaves. Thomas Jefferson wrote more than any abolitionist ever wrote against slavery. And Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. It is wrong to assume that because people had slaves that they believed in slavery. And we'll talk in depth about this when we get into the Civil War. Uh, you say, well, why would they have them? Because they had 100,000 acre plantations that they had to farm to uh, keep the American government uh, or keep the American people in clothing and food and everything else. And they set a system up on slavery and it's hard to change a system overnight. Let me give you an idea. What if the federal government passed a law today that said it is cool down a little bit out anymore to use uh, so people over 35 through. years of age to build automobiles? They're still getting snow out in Utah. What would happen to the auto industry? <laughs> Y'all can keep it. You say, well, they wouldn't do that. I'm not arguing the right or wrong or whether they do. I'm just Utah, saying, what if they did? Montana, what if they no. said this? Because of the unfairness in gender in America and the, the discrimination between men and women, it is illegal now to hire men to build automobiles in America. What would happen to the auto industry? Freaking hate the day. Say, so we absolutely don't Okay, you say, well, they shouldn't have so many. We're not the arguing the floor. point of whether they should have men I'm going to rule the day. We're just man, saying, what if the federal go. government said, said right. that? Now they take yourself you back to 1865. We're not arguing whether <laughs> slavery uh, was, uh, you know, the best way to do it or not. We're just saying that's the way it was done. And the federal government passed a law saying from now on, no more slaves. <laughs> right. That's what How much more are you going to looking at? Somebody that was about You're to pass legislation that would destroy the agricultural base of living in the South. Now we'll look at that more as we get into it. But 1831, 30 years, the fuel begins to uh, explode. And, and they the got set up, to dude, divide the American time, people. In 1832, I'm really out of a, uh, that's your Ohio in the world, Oberlin College has the famous college in the world. Uh, Oberlin College in 1832 began to admit women and blacks. And uh, the I don't first college in the world to do that. Well, that uh, up until that point, uh, it just says you put they were not allowed, off or at least they were not under only special circumstances. Out in front of you, but Oberlin you gotta, College, you know, again, uh, another seedbed of, of because, abolitionist you know, ideals, and uh, you know they uh, uh, basically were right uh, opposed him, to slavery. A lot of the abolitionist ideals I agree with. I'm not trying to give you a wrong impression. It's such a problem. I believe that was not the issue of the Civil War, as we'll see. He had. So they begin to admit problem. blacks and women. Now, into the other area. 
And this is the area we've been talking about and we want to deal with this morning. And uh, that is what's going on in America as far as a religious undercurrent or as far as God is concerned. And uh, a lot of these issues here, I don't think the Lord really, you know, got excited when uh, Morris invented the telegraph. I don't think that really, you know, stopped heaven and you know, sent heaven reeling when he invented the telegraph. Or when, uh, you know, McCormick invented the reaper, especially when John Deere invented the steel plow. I, I just don't think things like that. And if I step heaven. on the pedal, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think heaven did flip flop when Elon Trump walked on, walk on the moon or when George Bush beat Saddam Hussein. I don't think America, God played, paid the, the slightest yeah. bit of uh, yeah, attention to that. I don't think here. it thrilled him any at all. The it's things just, that uh, move the heart of God are so And uh, righteousness. I want back to the nation. Months. And uh, this great revival uh, but, is going uh, on in America yeah, <coughs> at this but, uh, time. He's, One of the fellows. Uh, yeah, I thought it was weird too. Uh, and I, I say this, I must apologize. Being a Baptist, it wasn't the Baptist that started all this. Uh, so, you know, we would like to think that it was, you know, independent, Bible-believing, fundamental Baptist churches that started this great revival. But in both cases, it wasn't. Uh, the uh, the uh, second the great awakening bright. literally was started it goes around uh, from the, the uh, foundations the laid of by the, a man in the England, and uh, his like, name was John Wesley. Ah, so and uh, John Wesley was one of the greatest preachers that ever lived on, lights, on the face of the it, earth. No, Wesley, in his no lifetime, it is reported, rode over 15,000 miles on horseback. Now, that's not a long distance for us. Some of us got that many frequent flyer miles. But uh, uh, <clears throat> to do that on horseback in a lifetime is an unbelievable thing. And Wesley would preach sometimes five to seven times a day. My for first weeks problem weeks with, on the, end. with this uh, Wesley, of I course, formed the Methodist. Uh, I do not agree with all of John Wesley's theology. As I came in, I'm doing everything here. Salvation. What's up? Certainly, I don't agree with Can't that. But John Wesley you, preached the gospel, the, and okay. he preached, you must be um, born again, and people today, got right? born again. The, and uh, that movement spread to such an extent that, uh, uh, well, we're on the subject, Georgia. <laughs> Uh, Georgia became a colony for uh, what we would call, I guess, religious fanatics uh, over here. Fort Oglethorpe and some of those places there uh, uh, were settled by people who came to this country as a result of the great awakening that the took quote, place God, in England and uh, people that were saved. Wesley sent some uh, what we call on website, missionaries to this country. Your, One of them was basement. Francis Asbury. And you've probably heard of Asbury College, a Methodist college. Uh, Francis Asbury came to this country, and he was a circuit riding preacher. And uh, he messages. basically was uh, confined to the areas of New England, what we know of as New England now. And uh, it is reported that during Asbury's ministry, over 500,000 people were converted. Uh, now that's uh, an unbelievable amount even by our standards, but you can imagine in a much, much, much smaller America what it would mean to see 500,000 people converted. And uh, we're talking about the old days when, you know, people would scream and cry and beg God to save them and uh, uh, that type of thing. Preaching was a little different, you know. We've made uh, preaching more political. Yeah, that's the tough. Time. 65. You know, we're, Although we're I've seen some of the drivers and being 65 and then passing me. But you'd I'm never like, know hey. I mean, I mean, you know, they these, these oh, guys I were, get it. Uh, we probably would look at him coming into our pulpit and say, well, the dirty compromiser, look at him, he's got a robe on, you know, and uh, he, he looks like one of these fancy, duded up things. But when he started preaching, you'd know the difference. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, we talked yeah, about his should, sermon, uh, hey, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, preached in the first Great Awakening. Uh, Jonathan Edwards literally <laughs> wrote his sermon out on paper. Trick the system. You know, what, a, what a dull thing to hear somebody read a sermon. Uh, 129. And and, uh, he stood up still on scene and read Rockport. his manuscript. Uh, you can say that that was preaching back then. And uh, yet God got so involved in that as he they read that, people were like, screaming and running oh, yeah, from the building, climbing up into the pews for fear that they were going to fall into hell before course, he was finished preaching that sermon. Be. And, and uh, I mean, a great, great sermon, but God got involved in that stuff. As a preach, he was what was called a circuit riding preacher. I mean, have you ever heard of uh, that terminology? A circuit riding preacher. Uh, obviously, in this day and time, if there were churches uh, outside of the realm of the large cities, uh, they were not very big. You had little settlements, and honestly, you had towns of 20 people. 
uh, where only 20 people live, maybe two or three families. And uh, obviously they did not have enough even money-wise to build a church. He's got a lightweight. And so these circuit riders became an yeah. integral part of American history because they would ride from community so to community and preach. And uh, yeah, they, uh, for the most part, if they were paid yeah. anything at all, they would Which get a chicken you know, to, or a, uh, a ham, something along that line. Uh, uh, the people that. would feed but them while they were there, give them a place to stay, and literally, it's uh, probably much yes, closer to what the New Testament idea was when the Lord so came to the that. And, and he said, don't uh, take any money, don't take any coach, you know, guy just go and, and let the people there take care of you. And that was uh, uh, the truck. idea of the circuit riding and he's preachers. Got a, a lot of that remains to this so, day in the South. Uh, kind of some rookie. of the churches down there, you have a church like building, me. and they'll only meet every other Sunday. Uh, on my right here. Uh, you know, you have a, a so, protracted something or other, and they'll meet every other Sunday because they don't have a preacher. The preacher's preaching down the road 20 miles, and he's 11, literally pastoring two or three or sometimes four churches. I remember at my grandmother's church way back, this is probably, you know, Civil War days when I was just a boy. Uh, I remember that uh, they were at church, I think every third Sunday they had a pastor there. We are not about and tonight. Uh, the other two weeks, I'm glad he was there, but they didn't have a preacher, the because the process. preacher was, so was writing a circuit, and he was only there every third week to uh, hold services for those people. So that uh, grew out of the circuit writing uh, uh, ideals, and of course, Asbury begins uh, writing the circuit down in Kentucky and Tennessee, the revival began to move. Uh, in 1802, uh, there was a revival that broke out at Yale University, and believe it or not, we can hear someone break out there now. At Yale University, in less than two weeks, one-third of the student body was preaching and converted to Jesus Christ. Now you can only imagine what that had to do with uh, the more Lord Lord. Lord. Or, I guess, yes, find a good word, again. Uh, of things that were going on in that university campus. But in Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, a young man uh, 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 there uh, in one of those circuit riding meetings was converted. His name was Peter Cartwright. And uh, Peter Cartwright became probably the, the hellfire and damnation preacher of the South of his generation. He uh, probably was better known there than a lot of other people to this day. But Peter Cartwright we preached say a uh, prayer. Uh, revival meetings and camp meetings. May we'll talk about so those in a minute. In uh, all throughout uh, Kentucky and Tennessee and even on well, the I know there's a way of Illinois that you in through that area there. Uh, Peter I Cartwright, again, was uh, renowned for seeing people yeah, you convert trick the computer system. His, even uh, if you bring it into the and, shop, it just shows uh, the that The camp meeting ideal broke out basically in uh, never went over. Kentucky and Tennessee. Peter Cartwright, as a matter of fact, preached a number of times to Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson used so every time you're in the yard, Peter they're Cartwright downloading it. Cartwright said that he never knew see, like, Jack Chilton to become a Christian so in the so sense of accepting Christ, at least not his meeting. I don't know how but uh, Jackson was that noted that uh, had a profound uh, respect <laughs> for Christianity if he wasn't saved. He had a profound respect for Christianity you. that he attributed to the Lord. I'm just going to say, I'm 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 so uh, the preachers back then were a little unusual. You know, they uh, basically could care less what I had to say, and they preached about we need more of that time in this day and time. Uh, but uh, Cartwright became so famous that he got a buddy who, uh, in later years of his life his and uh, ran for a seat in the legislature. A lot of people don't know that, you know but uh, he actually won. He, he defeated the fellow that he was yeah, yeah, running like against 70. for the seat in the legislature, you know. and uh, that's only you important in the fact that uh, the fellow like, that dude, he defeated was a young man you named Lincoln. You realize still on the lease, right? I tell you this And uh, Peter Cartwright defeated Lincoln for a seat in the Illinois like, State Legislature because he was so well known as a preacher and so respected as a man of God. Uh, you can't tell you have a fellow by the name of Don't even go there about the money. Carl Penny, you go there about the money. He's one of the most important people in the world. Half a million corporations were in his ministry. And Penny becomes known as one of the greatest people in the world. Nobody's going to want to drive for you. You can't manage your business. And that's very well method. It's not a good thing. When you get down to Penny, he was a Presbyterian. That should never come out of his mouth. You say, well, what's different about the Presbyterians? Well, they'd be like, no, dude. 
Come no, on. No, 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 no. Uh, but back That's then, right. oh, to be honest with you, there world. were several groups. Can't worry about me. That's like no. the gospel. And uh, the this Methodist, guy down and my mother was a, a saved oh, Methodist. She was saved yeah. in the Methodist church. And uh, they used to preach the gospel. The Presbyterians used to preach the gospel. They preached that men had to be saved, had to be born again. And uh, we've gone different paths down in the history. But uh, Finney became so a pastor the and pastored money. a great church you know, in New York lease. City, a large I'm congregation. Get my money back. And uh, yeah. uh, yeah. he yeah. became known as the greatest Life revivalist. Truck. Finney wrote books yeah. on revival. He, he started talking about it. Uh, uh, his own problems. I'm like, how oh, revival comes uh, there at this time. To this day, right. his books are probably like, well, well, not and read by preachers more than any other author that wrote on revival. Uh, he talked about the Bible. He went to the Bible to come on. Finney was a lawyer. His conversion is one of the Find another free uh, line. Uh, the first time Finney ever read a Bible, he was preparing for a church against a preacher or a church or a religious individual. And he actually published the Bible to use against this stuff. He was going to prepare his case from the foundation of this as a Bible man. So I'm going to take the Bible and destroy his case. And Finney began to read the Bible and noted in his own journal that as he read the Bible, it worked in his life like no other book he'd ever experienced. And he found himself at times closing his law practice for a whole day so he could read this book that he had brought into his possession. Yeah, I call those advice holes. Time when he took a break from his office. You're an advice hole. One day he walked out into the woods and he was gone for four or five hours. like you asked for and they said when Finney came back Yo, to his office, his advice. face literally yeah, was lighted, was shining. You're an advice hole. And Finney had gone out there and gotten shorty yeah, and became uh, because of his uh, ability in law. I mean, he was not a dumb man. He became one of the greatest preachers really that America don't. saw in its day. Because he had the ability to argue and persuade from the word of God. But uh, it's kind of interesting. He, he got uh, in contact with the Bible in an attempt to destroy. You don't have to take it. Uh, what it had to say. It? And so, you know, it's a funny thing. The Word of God does some unusual things, doesn't it? I but get your point. Was converted dealing with those type of deals, I want to hear about You're going to do whatever you're going to do. Well, yeah, a young man who was born, who was, uh, uh, again, to become a uh, uh, famous individual. He uh, was a uh, shoe salesman. And his name was Moody. Dwight Lyman Moody. I get like that. And Moody was a congregationalist. You know, Baptists will get there so later. Just that's our time. thing. We, uh, but Moody was a get out of And uh, uh, as Moody was growing up, uh, he was so teaching, uh, or what, he was selling to one of the people. And, and uh, began to go to Sunday school, attending once or twice, and was visited by his Sunday school teacher. This ought to be an encouragement to our Sunday school teacher. Sometimes you think, well, these great evangelists, they came out of great churches. Yeah, but sometimes it was Sunday school teachers that made the difference in their life. That was really good. The that. Bell, his name was Mr. Kilmer, Kilmer, K I L N R, or Kibler, one of the two. I can't Mr. remember exactly. Mr. Destructive right now. himself. But uh, his Sunday school teacher went to pay him a visit in the shoe store. And uh, Most destructive guy I've ever by his own testimony, he walked past the shoe, shoe store a couple of times and thought, well, I'm not going to go in and waste this fellow's time. He's probably busy. All the excuses you and I have for not witnessing. Hey, and then, let's just pause. Even though we're teaching, it's good to get those teachers out of there. And, and uh, he's afraid just like diarrhea. you and I are. Finally, he uh, made up his mind he was going to go back and talk to this young man. When he went in, he sat down and began to witness to uh, Dwight Lyman Moody. And Moody accepted Christ right there in the shoe store and uh, went to join the church. It's interesting, back then, when you wanted to join a church, you know, you were kind of hungry for people to join the church. And uh, back then, if you wanted to join the church, they quizzed you, they tested you. Oh, uh, yeah, I've met plenty of this stuff. And uh, yeah. when they finished quizzing Moody, one of the preachers that quizzed him made the statement, I don't have an exact quote, so but it was something along the line, I have so never seen I any individual how, more I, you know, unfit to belong to a church dad, Mom, than this individual. Know. said he is totally yeah. ignorant of the scriptures. He is totally is void of any knowledge off. of godliness. But this young girl. man believed to be saved. That's all he said you know about what the Moody crazy was that we know he's saved. And uh, they admitted him into the I'm church. I'm sorry to talk about and, this. And uh, he uh, uh, basically sat there and learned for a while. Because he seems like he could be in Chicago, he began to see all these people out in the streets of Chicago. And he began to talk to his preacher because those were the days when people actually owned pews. I've never been to a church where people. People own pews. It was kind of like a family pews. 
And what do you um, think about this? Most of these seats what were empty. do you think about that? And so Moody began to ask his preacher, You're always you know, searching why don't we try to build to just the opposite of everybody. Uh, and uh, he told Moody, he said, well, when all you do is just got to you. What Moody was going to do is go get sure, you don't have a fit, and, and, and you'll do it to the and point well, Moody where had other to ideas. Dis- Moody went out into the yourself. slums and ghettos of Chicago so and began opposite. to pick up little, they called them hoodlums. <laughs> Little boys and girls that were called yeah. hoodlums, and Moody showed up Crazy. with uh, in just a couple of weeks with about 20 of these little hoodlums, Never. and brought them into church and started putting them in the seats, and uh, they said oh you can't God. bring those people in here. You know, refined, highbrow church. They said that's not the kind of people we want in here. Yeah. And so Moody was responsible for starting a Sunday school, and uh, his Sunday school grew. I think at one time why it was over twenty thousand in attendance. And uh, well, Moody just, did that just, just by going out and getting it. the hoodlums. So, uh, uh, but Moody enough. became a great, great preacher. It is said that when and Moody then, would preach, he had a great, so white, took, uh, flowing beard. Uh, swampy politics and when Moody would preach so on hell, position the tears would run down his face and with literally drip from his beard while he preached. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people converted under the preaching of Dwight Lyman Moody. And, of course, the Moody Bible Institute, which today is just a... Uh, shadow of what Moody intended, uh, liberal nothing, but Moody founded the great Moody Bible Institute. The crazy thing and, is, uh, is that everybody here. else is and, guiding uh, uh, is basically great ministry that he had. Moody, it is said, when he would come from his hotel right? room sometimes during you know, his meetings and walk down the street, you were a the people would literally drop even to though their you're knees an and ask God to forgive them as he walked by. Faith. And because of how I've been hearing this said about you, and uh, Moody made a statement you were in his life. He said, The world has yet to do what you are made with to go away man, from it. One woman totally, completely surrendered to the will of God. At the end of his life, they asked me to move. Obviously, he's been Don't tell me you don't need people. Shook his head. Yeah, and you, you love me. He said, The world is still waiting to see what God can do with one man. What did they say? Totally, completely surrendered to the will of God. Uh, a great preacher. Uh, of course, Ira Sankey uh, is a name that comes to mind. He was the, the song leader uh, for D.L. Moody. And uh, Sankey was a great hymn writer and a great musician that uh, held those great meetings that they had. Camp meetings uh, began to show up. And again, camp meetings, we have them today, but they're not really camp meetings. Uh, in the olden days, the camp the meeting, you got to realize the idea of vacation had really yeah, swept right, yeah. through the masses. So uh, vacation has always one. been uh, but, an aristocratic ideal. I mean, I can, okay, now I'm going to preach you about vacation this morning. You'd be glad no longer have five minutes left, so what damage could I do? Uh, Vacation has always been an aristocratic idea. I mean, it was the aristocrats, the people with the lace handkerchiefs and the lace on their collar that got to go and take holidays in in other parts of the world and other places. The common man did not have that option. Uh, He had to work hard for a living. He had to labor. And he was lucky if he could scarcely take a day a week and have any time to himself. Because of that, the church <laughs> is on the road last night in common <laughs> everyday American life. I'm one still day laughing week, about it. I keep going and, and in my head. I'm like, oh my God. Powerful, powerful <laughs> men of God in the pulpits. Uh, literally, there wasn't any movies, there wasn't any television, there wasn't any radio. Um, sometimes I sit and listen in my home. I, Put a CD on of some good orchestra music, and I'll set thing. You know, people in the 1800s, they had no concept of this. They couldn't sit down during the day and listen to music. Unless they played it themselves. They're, and to me, uh, one of the great blessings is the ability to sit down and turn on some music and just listen and relax. They don't have it. They don't have it. And uh, church became an important village in the lives of these people. It was a place where they discussed news. It was a place where they found out what was going on. It was a place where they came and heard the preaching of the Word of God, where they prayed. And uh, oftentimes they'd come and have what they call dinner on the ground. We still have them here. And they'd come on a Sunday, and uh, Mom would get up early in the morning, 5 or 6 o'clock, and kill a couple of chickens. And you thought I was going to say she took a couple. No, she had to kill them first. She'd get up 5 or 6 in the morning and kill a couple of chickens and pluck those things out and and uh, cook those chickens up and uh, fix a meal, put it in a basket, and off they go to church. 
And uh, these people set those baskets in the back of the church. And uh, the flavor or a yeah, that food would whack the food. So and the congregation dying. is that preacher preaching for about two and a half, three hours. Great. And at the conclusion of his message, they'd all go out and sit around on the grounds, and uh, they'd go out to the well and dig down there or drop oh, down man. the bucket and bring up a bucket full of fresh, clean water. Yeah, and uh, if they were lucky, somebody would have a lemon or two yes, and make so some lemonade. And if not, they'd drink water and they'd sit there and eat their food so on the lot. ground and fellowship. What are you talking and about? And that dude? was the focal point of it. You wanted life. all this stuff. You and uh, as that became attention. more and more apparent, you know, uh, and these circuit like, riding okay, preachers so would come through. Since they could not be there every Sunday, they would organize well, you go ahead and what was even as large as four or <laughs> five like counties, and, and they'd have a camp meeting. Whatever the hell and a camp meeting consisted sometimes know. of two weeks, where people would come, usually uh, prior to, to the harvest, that. just prior That's to the so harvest, funny. or just following the harvest. Come on, man. And uh, they'd go out there on a hillside, and they'd uh, build them yeah. a big brush arbor, and they'd uh, take yeah. put up poles and a a kind of a roof, make like a thatched roof, and throw hay up in there, and make them a place to get out of the rain. And people would come and bring tents and covered wagons and they Nobody. sleep. Nobody out around this place here. and all day long every day they just well, preach and preach and channel. preach and like preach a, and uh, fellowship and preach and fellowship and preach and fellowship and preach and that was what the old the camp it's meeting was all about that probably part produced part uh, the yeah. attitude that we had about vacations because people began to expect and they began to go and uh, they began to take a week or two off every year of the camp meeting and as America got more and more, and more and ungodly and they stopped going to camp meetings and started going to other places. But uh, those things began. Moody was born and began his ministry. Uh, another incident that I need to tell you about before we leave this morning is uh, at Williams College. Williams College, uh, a group of individuals got together and they began to pray. I just and, heard God uh, listening in. They uh, were all deeply touched by what just was going on and uh, the preaching around America. And uh, one afternoon, it's pretty good, though, uh, just down continuing for, they, on with the uh, conversation. Out the fields and and it the rain, and uh, because they didn't have any place to get out of the rain, they like actually now. crawled underneath a big haystack. Uh, and uh, they were praying underneath that haystack, and it became known as the Haystack Prayer Meeting. And the Haystack Prayer Meeting literally is what moved America to missions. If you study missions at all. You can't study missions in America without studying the Haystack Prayer Meeting. Uh, out of that group of individuals, uh, all I think there were seven or eight of them, and I believe all of them went as missionaries to places around the world. One of them, a couple of them, uh, Luther Rice, uh, you probably heard that name, Adoniram Judson. And uh, some of those individuals were praying in that group, and God touched their hearts about the needs of the world. And uh, they went around the world. Uh, it is one estimated one, that uh, Adam Iron Jackson oh, alone is responsible for perhaps as many as three quarters of a million Burmese conversions in the country of Burma. And uh, those individuals were used by God. Now, Rice and Judson were not Baptists when they left America. But before they got to where they were going, they were back to where they were And something began to happen at this point in time. Doctrine began to seem important to these people. You say, why would that be that way? God's fixing to spread the gospel out. And uh, Justin got on the boat, watched the believe in infant baptism and several other ideals when he got on the boat. But you got to realize that uh, a trip from America to Burma uh, could literally take five or six weeks on a boat. And he began to read his Bible. And as he began to read his Bible, he began to be more and more convinced that some of the things he'd been taught theologically did not line up with the Word of God. And uh, these people literally began to be what we'd call Bible believers. <laughs> You know, uh, before then, they were just uh, I see one of the profiles on there. I caught my interest. Yeah, because that one new group of calls and stuff whistling bits, you, man. You got enough ammo? You got enough radio equipment in that picture? Yeah. That's a good one, perhaps. Even. Uh, since the days of Martin Luther, uh, they began to search the Bible again, began to take a stand uh, on uh, what the Bible said, began to part company with people that were of differing uh, uh, doctrinal viewpoints, and God began to use these individuals. But uh, we hear sometimes about Adoniram Judson and his change, but Luther Rice was the same way. Luther Rice changed uh, when he got off the boat. He was a Baptist, and he was a Baptist by conviction of what the Word of God had said. So uh, uh, just a little bit of an idea. That kind of fills in the, the area between 1820 and, and 1860.
uh, as what is going on in this country. Uh, there's a lot of material there. I don't expect that everybody will retain all that was there. But uh, bear in mind, this was a great time of revival. And uh, because of that, America prospered. And uh, prospered probably as great in that time period than it did at any other time period in its history. Uh, the westward expansion was unfathomable. 1348. Oh, what are you talking about, Joey? Did I miss something? Gold rush. Who said that? All right. Somebody knew. We're all looking for some gold, aren't we? Uh, 1848, Sutter's Mill in California, the gold rush. And uh, you say, why is that important? Because that one event spurred the westward migration of America. Uh, there were people that were kind of reluctant. We were kind of sideways heavy. We were filling up on the East Coast. Nobody wanted to make that journey because of the opposition of Indians and barrenness of the plains and that. But when gold was discovered out there at Sutter's Mill, boy, people began to pack up Conestoga wagons and head out seeking their fortune. And uh, America became widely dispersed then in its population because people began to move. This is a Try to move ahead this morning all the way up till uh, just the time of the outbreak of the Civil War. And um, uh, again, swing ahead a few years. We covered kind of that intermediate gap last week. We talked about the increases in uh, the 